Hello, Tom. So good to have you with us. How are you today? I'm doing great, Bill. Thank you for having me on your show. You bet, man. I am so fired up to have you. As I told you before, I feel like I feel like I'm interviewing Jack Ryan. That's all I know about the CIA, right? <laughs> that's the only guy I know, and he's not a real character. But it's that's how I visualize you. So that's where it's going in my brain. But let me tell people a little bit about, you know, I mentioned some things in the intro, but let me just tell them a little bit about your background. And please correct me if I'm, mm. if I'm wrong on any of this stuff. So 25, uh, sorry, 24 years with the CIA as a GS-15 senior security manager. That's what I uh, retired as, yes. Okay. Uh, got it. Head, headed up a series of agencies at undisclosed for undisclosed protective operations teams, meaning, as you just said, you got to protect high value targets, but you also have to be invisible. Correct. Yeah. Yes. Um, you were not doing this in the U.S. This is not like easy duty in Atlanta or Langley. This is uh, multiple war zones in North Africa, Latin America, Southeast Asia, Europe, and the Middle East. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. And I think for us, right, for the listener, the thing that I would want people to know is your book, Guardian, which we're going to talk about in a moment, and I know there's more to the title, um, gives us a behind-the-scenes look of some of the best-known conflicts of our time that we know about, right? The two that come to mind would be both Black Hawk Down and the hunt for Osama bin Laden. Correct. Yeah. yeah. Hey, tell us just a little bit about your book. Uh, Guardian, uh, Life in the Crosshairs of the CIA's War on Terror, comes out on 7 May. And uh, it's right, it's on for pre-publication sale. It's on Amazon and Barnes & Noble right now. Um, I'm uh, looking forward to some also some, some book signings once it comes out. No but, doubt. No doubt. Yeah, let us know when that's happening, man. I'd love to be there for that. Um, fantastic. And... And so lastly, at the, uh, you know, as you now look back on your career, and now you've got another career going with uh, private security, and we'll, we'll talk about that in a moment as well. And now uh, as an author, which is fantastic, that sort of yeah. changed the game, right? That changes oh. your pedigree a bit. Um, but somewhere in your home is a career intelligence medal, and the intelligence star, which as I understand it, is the highest honor for valor with the clandestine services. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. Uh, and also the met meritorious unit citation. And the, the reason I bring all that up, I didn't serve in the military, so I'm part of the 99%. If it's 1% that service in the military, I can't even imagine how few serve what percentage of the population serve in the CIA. That's a very, very, very small number. But what I know for sure is you don't get those medals for hanging out and filling out reports. No. So, so thank you for your service. We appreciate what you did for our country. No, I appreciate that. Yeah, man. So, so, you know, you don't just helicopter into a war zone working for the CIA without having to, evolve some of your personal DNA the way that you showed up, right, in, in, in some other area of your life. I happen to know from our previous conversations that that was competitive wrestling. And I would love for people to hear a little bit about that part of your life, because that's actually easier for people to relate to, I think, than the CIA clandestine services, right? Yeah, absolutely. Tell us about that. Yeah, I grew up uh, one of five boys, all wrestlers, on the south side of Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And um, uh, I was very competitive with my older brother. And uh, uh, when he joined wrestling, I knew I had to do that, too, just to, to keep him from beating me up. Of course uh, you did. Yeah. <laughs> so um, it, it, was a, it was a pivotal point for, for, for my brothers and I because um, – we really uh, enjoyed the, the, the competitive aspect of wrestling, the physicality, and it gave us some focus and some drive. Um, and then there was a pivotal moment in my wrestling career when my brother was wrestling in the state uh, championships and um, seeing him uh, fight and, and train and prepare to get to that point and and he ended up taking second 
and at that point, I, I, I made up my mind. That's what I wanted. I wanted to be a state champion. I wanted to be our high school's first state champion. Yeah. And I decided that uh, whatever it took. So I was going to, uh, I was going to train. I was going to, so uh, that, if that meant like going taking a city bus up to this uh, Marquette university had Wednesday night wrestling, yeah. going to tournaments in the summers, lifting weights, avoiding alcohol and other <laughs> distractions. Yes. Yeah. And, um, uh, I, I decided that whatever was going to take in terms of preparation, I was going to do. Nice. And I wanted to join that group of, of people who are that focused. Love that. Love that that had an appeal to you at what age? Oh, uh, that was, uh, when I was a freshman in, in high school. So, yeah, yeah. I really, I, I appreciate you saying that because I think it's so important for, for parents or grandparents who might be listening to this to consider that decision and the power of that decision and how it helped to mold you, Tom, and become the man that you did. And I think that, you know, whether it's athletics or scholastics or music or martial arts or the military, if we can find a way to learn how to, to learn that lesson that you did early on, it makes a world of difference for us as adults. Wouldn't you agree? Absolutely. The, 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 the principles behind hard work, and then, you know, what does hard work get you? I mean, when you start to really believe that hard work, number one, is, is a, a good thing in itself, and two, that it's going to get you where you want to go, and you believe it, um, you're almost unstoppable. That's uh, right. At that point, you're, you can focus. And, and the other part that wrestling um, gave me, or any of the competitive sports, is... Uh, the looking at your performance, being mm -hmm. able to critique it, improve it, and and keep moving forward. Absolutely, and that's, a, that's a lesson for life, you know. Yeah, man. So so so, tell us a little bit about your your experience in wrestling. I mean, is this just something that you dabbled with a bit in college, or uh, well, tell us about I, where this went? I, as a senior, I, I took the state championship. Nice. And then I ended up at that, uh, yeah, that was a great moment, first state champion from our high school. Yeah. And then I went on to college, and I, I, I went to a college where I wrestled in Division I, uh, and it was tough. Uh, best, best wrestlers in the, in, in the nation. Wow. And it was, it was a grind, four years. Uh, I didn't reach my goal of being an All-American and placing, but um, I made it to the national tournament twice. Excellent. Uh, and I was rated 18th. And uh, looking back, it was, it, you know, it kept me focused on moving ahead and really working hard. But then when I graduated from college, I went to grad school and I didn't have wrestling anymore. And I kind of lost focus. I, did, I didn't know what I was going to do. Mm -hmm. And that's when I was coaching wrestling. And then I uh, ended up <laughs> answering an ad in, in the local newspaper uh, for employment at the CIA. <laughs> okay, hang on. So the CIA, at least then, was looking for talent by running ads in the newspaper. Correct. Strange I find this sound. surprising. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Answered the ad, uh, got hired, and then uh, found myself doing background investigations, which, uh, if you know anything about them, it, it's a lot of interviewing, a lot of report writing. Wow. And it's a lot of work on your own, and it was boring. I'll bet. And I thought, wow, I mean, I mean, I'm working at the CIA and I'm bored and this is, maybe this isn't for me. And then what happened was uh, I, I said, okay, I'm going to do something in the meantime to kind of get some excitement. So I started coaching wrestling and then I started to work me out and I decided to start to compete again. And at this point, there was an opportunity for a training class, um, mm. a new training uh, opportunity at the CIA called, uh, in protective operations. Mm -hmm. um, and nobody really knew what it was, but it sounded interesting, so I applied. And there was going to be a, a, a delay before they made the decision. So during that period, I decided to wrestle in the U.S. Freestyle National Championships. And um, I, uh, at that point, I, it was an interesting life um, moment because I ran into a guy who was, uh, well, at this point, he's still the the best U.S. wrestler in, his, in our history. And really? I, yes, at that <laughs> I mean, point. Holy, holy yeah. cow. This uh, is... I, 
I got him early, early in the round, so it was, oh. it was bad news for me. Um, wow. I think he was 152 and, and four in international competition. Wow. He was a, he was a three-time world champion. He was already an Olympic champion, and he was going on quest for his second. I ran into him in uh, early rounds. He had just slaughtered the two guys before me. Awesome. Went on the map. You're watching that, by the way? Oh, I watched him destroy these other guys. Great. So I'm thinking, That's good oh, for boy. the old ego. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I knew I was in for a fight. <laughs> so we got out there. The first period's three minutes. I, um, I think it was the best uh, wrestling I ever done, I've ever done in my life. I wow. attacked and defended. And at the end of the first period, it, the score was 0-0. Zero, zero. Wow. That's and impressive. Yeah, the the, the crowd the, was reacting. Rocky music, right? Oh, yeah. I was, yeah. Was, if only the match would have ended there. But uh, <laughs> the crowd started to really walk because for John Smith um, to not be way ahead mm. at that point was unusual. Uh, I saw him in the corner recalibrating, and then he came back at me hard the, the second period, and I, I was down by quite a few points. And at the end, it was about ten seconds left. I I went for the Hail Mary. I went for a throw and I didn't get it and I got pinned. But as I walked mm -hmm. off the mat, um, you know, I, I, it, was a, it was a defining moment. I said, okay, may, I need to get focused on something. And then I read an article about him and about how absolutely committed he was to his uh, second gold medal. Wow. And I said, well, I'm, I need that in my life. I'm going to be uh, committing myself to my job. Uh, it's not going to be iffy. I'm going in. And I um, ended up getting that protection up, uh, protective operations training class. Nice. First, in, first in, of, its time, uh, of its kind in 1991. And that was a huge turning point in terms of my career. And I'd have to say uh, in, for my life because. So cool what I got into and, and, and my experiences after that. Well, yeah, right. I, of course, we never know that at the time, right? When you're no. in it, it's like, ah, all my hopes, all my dreams. But I love that you made the decision because it. I don't know how quickly that happened. And maybe it was that day. Maybe it was a week or a month later. But yeah. at some point, you made the decision to not wallow in the self-pity of I lost there. And you said, I'm going to be all in. I mean, obviously, that's my phrase. Yeah. Not like I originated it, so you <laughs> lived it back then, right? So, yes. so now protective services, brand new department, brand new discipline. You're moving in. What year is this now? This is 1991. So 91. When was the coal attacked? Oh, let's see. That would have been. I'm thinking that's 93. Okay, yeah. so this is just the beginning of what came to be known as the global war on terror. Is that correct? A absolutely. I, yeah. I was actually, uh, my second job at the agency was working in the security duty office. And I was on duty when um, a Pakistani terrorist attacked our people at the, at the gate. Wow. And killed a number of them and wounded a number. And that was at, the at your gate. At the CIA's front gate. Holy cow. Didn't never, I never heard this story. I didn't know yes. that. It was pr prior to the attack on uh, World Trade Center. And this was first the real first watershed moment for us uh, in terms of, uh, of this type of attack on a, on, a, on a federal facility by a terrorist. And then, of course, the World Trade Center happened. And, um, and uh, so uh, the, the terrorism pattern, I, I was in the terrorism pattern for my whole career. I wow. later on uh, uh, was working in... Um, in the uh, in Asia, when there were attacks on embassies, I was, uh, and then I was uh, in um, uh, in the Pakistan Afghan region when we were hunting Bin yeah. Laden. Wow! So all throughout my career, it's been this uh, terrorism, reacting to terrorism, protecting right. our people. Right. Well, yeah, we needed new strategies, new tactics. That makes sense. So the, the one of the cool things that people if people friend you or follow you on LinkedIn. And by the way, are you Tom there or are you yeah, Thomas? Thomas. Okay, Thomas, Tom, Bacora, Thomas yeah. Bacora. Um One of the things that they'll see is there are some little sneak peeks of various chapters. And the most recent one, at least at the time that we were, were recording here, I think I read chapter six. And it's the one with the pictures of the Isuzu, right? 
Yep. That's so I would love for you to, in the interest of time, I would love for them to hear that a little of that story in this light. At some point, Tom, you're, you're not wearing a uniform. You're not surrounded by Marines. I mean, I'm sure there are moments where you were mm -hmm. or special operations. But when you're on your own and you're having to dress incognito and be relatively invisible and you don't have all of the ideal gear for the particular mission that you're needing to accomplish in protective services there's some interesting things that happen but you have to make a decision i think right about yes. really being all in or otherwise i think all of your just self-preservation instincts would kick in and be like uh yeah. this seems like a really good idea bad idea i need to get out of here so yes. so can you tell us about that just in the in the way that you mm -hmm. do it in the book about that moment in time and I just love for people to hear that story because I think to me it epitomizes that all-in philosophy. Yes, the um, uh, getting in that type of work, uh, you, you have to be, you have to believe in yourself, and you have to believe in your training, and you have to be continuously working to improve, and that's part of of that commitment part. And that means that when you end up in a situation that is not ideal, you look for ways to increase your ability. And so in, in Somalia in, in 1993, uh, we were stuck with basically no armored vehicles that we could use. Mm. And we, so we had a vehicle that we decided that we were going to try to improve. We found armored plating from a helicopter, two pieces. So we added that to the vehicle. Mm. We added ballistic vests around the seats. We added tinted windows. And we, and we actually drove in unusual patterns so that we didn't look like a motorcade. Interesting. All these things raised our our uh, survivability level, yeah, and made it much more difficult for the bad guys. In this case, uh, wow. uh, the warlord Faradid, Muhammad Faradid, from uh, being able to attack us. Unfortunately, he, he got lucky. We ran into an ambush that was really staged for another group. Wow! And, uh, wrong place, wrong time. Yes, but but in that moment of time, the person that you were protecting was hit if i if i recall yes. this correctly mm -hmm. and then after the fact and and thankfully you were able to administer first aid and yes. uh, i don't know if you survived mm -hmm. or not but at least yes, you got it through that that yes. experience but the interesting thing to me is after the fact right so there's this photograph of the isuzu and there's kind of this blood-stained seat with the fabric oh, yeah. upholstery and obviously you lost a lot of blood but you you tell the story about where you were sitting Yes, there was. I was in the uh, left front. It was a right, right side drive vehicle. So I was sitting in the left front seat. And when we did an after action, we saw that the bullet head from the AK-47 had gone through the back window, hit my seat, should have struck me square in the middle of the back, which would have been fair. Uh, uh. It, the seat somehow deflected around sideways. It skidded along the top of the seat, hit the headrest poles, and then dropped down be behind the seat. And uh, Unfortunately, I was never able to recover that bullet because I'd be wearing it right like a necklace. Right. A good luck charm, but no, um, it wasn't my my day. Yeah, I'd it was say. not your day. It no. was not your day. But at at the end of the day, in those moments, and just like we saw in that movie, Thirteen Hours, talking about Benghazi, there there has to be this mentality of being all in. So if you can take me back to those moments where you were, you knew you were in danger. You knew you weren't going to be claimed that there was no quick reaction for us that was going to come after you how did you stay all in tom what was that was that patriotism was it the brotherhood of the the guy next to you was it your commitment to the service what what was it it's it's a combination of all of those you know you, uh, your your professionalism and i and that's a it's an overused term, but the professional really means taking pride in what you're doing. Yeah. Doing everything you can to be at the best uh, level you can be. And that's preparation. That's, um, that's working with your, with your teammates. Um, it's adding armor when we can find it. Yeah. Um, it's being aware and focused and not being distracted. Um, when you're on these runs where anything bad could happen. And then it's, it's basically come to terms that if something bad happens, um, it happens. You're right. right. You're, it, this is, this is, um, this is what I do. 
and I, I'm in, uh, you know, I, I, I will follow through until I can't. I love that, commitment. man. I love that mentality. And I, once again, on behalf of all of our listeners, I want to thank you for your service to our country because that kind of commitment blows my mind. It really does. And I'm so proud of the men and women that do what you do. It just, it really, it is inconceivable to me. So if people are engaged with you and enamored by you as they should be at this point, A, of course they need to pre-order your book, yeah. Guardian, and that's uh, both at Amazon and Barnes and Noble. Correct. I'd love for them to follow you on LinkedIn. If, if somebody has an interest in what you do in the private security realm, active shooter training, mm -hmm. situ situational awareness, is there is there a better site or is LinkedIn the best? Oh, way to LinkedIn's the best, but I also there's also a Facebook uh, page for Guardian for the book in terms of more information because I do some excerpts on there. But um, but LinkedIn's the best because I wrote I write articles on LinkedIn that right. people who are interested in personal safety, uh, if you are if you're interested in protective operations, I I write some mainly focused at the professional level, but I write it in such a way that. Um, People who are not familiar with it can get a, a lot of good information about how protective operations are done and what the principles are. Nice. So lots well, of information there on LinkedIn. I, uh, I, I could tell you that personally, I will be all over that. And I think the more that we can all do these days to understand the importance of situ aware, situational awareness, which primarily let's just begin by not walking around with looking at our phones. I'm just yes, thinking maybe that's a good absolutely. beginning. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, and then also in an active shooter situation, knowing what to do, right? I think running mm -hmm. around screaming with your hands in the air may not be the best strategy. So no. I look forward to uh, seeing what you put out there. Tom Pecora, what a pleasure. Thank you so much for making this time. We look forward to uh, staying in touch with you. And best of luck with the book, man. Thank you. I appreciate being here. You bet.